He's going to be doing his program today, so uh, yes. we'll enjoy. <coughs> Could we have a uh, round of applause for Jim Diggs? He's a uh, real guy. All right. So thank you all for coming. I heard some, some good conversations about Manchester and the Portsmouth branch, so we've got some allies in the, uh, in the audience. That's good to hear. Uh, when we're talking about the Portsmouth branch, what we're really talking about is a very rural branch line of the Boston and Maine, which was pretty unique in that it wasn't a dead-ended branch line. Now, a lot of the Boston and Maine's branch lines um, originally had been through routes and then eventually were cut back and became dead ends such as the Greenville branch, which was actually always a dead end. Um, but the Goffstown branch, uh, to name a few, the Hillsboro branch, these were lines that eventually <coughs> saw major cutbacks in their operations and ended up being dead end branches. But the Portsmouth branch, for almost all of its operation, was a through route between two major cities in New Hampshire. Despite that, the traffic level on the Portsmouth branch never really reached peak levels like you would expect it to for you know, a line between two important population centers. Uh, just a little bit of background, I grew up uh, in Raymond on the Portsmouth branch, obviously a long time after the railroad stopped running. Uh, I was actually born 15 years after the last train on the Portsmouth, this section of the Portsmouth branch. Um, so I didn't see any of it with my own eyes. So to me, the joy of discovering these photographs of things that were taken before I was born became the way I discovered the Boston and Maine's activity through my hometown. And growing up, going to the, the Raymond Station, which has been beautifully preserved, um, and just seeing these things and wondering why they were there, what had happened, when it had all ended. So what I've put together today is kind of a, a slideshow of some of those things leading up to the very end of train service on the Portsmouth branch, at least the middle section, or the, the initial section, rather, um, of the Portsmouth branch. So the first major decline on the Portsmouth branch was in 1954, which is when regular passenger service on the branch ended. At that point in time, it was being conducted with a gas car and a trailer, uh, which was pretty standard for Boston and Maine branch lines uh, in this period of time. It had been traditional train sets before that, um, but had switched over to a gas car uh, consist. So you see the train here on May 28, 1954, only a few months before passenger service on the branch would end, making a station stop. Um, this is an Al Hale photograph. He took all kinds of wonderful black and white photos of the Boston and Maine. Uh, most of his stuff is down at Beverly in the Walker Collection. Um, and if you look in the background here, you can see a freight car which has been spotted at uh, Regis Tanning, which was the tannery in Raymond, um, which did a lot of freight business. So there was a lot going on in Raymond at this point in time, um, and as we go through the presentation, you'll start to see that drop off and decline. Uh, but things look pretty good here in 1954, even though this is pretty close to the end of passenger service. A freight service on the Boston and Maine's uh, Portsmouth branch was conducted out of Concord to Portsmouth. So uh, at this point in time, this is a freight timetable from 1959 uh, from Scott Whitney. Uh, you can see that the Portsmouth job um, was Portsmouth, oh, here we go, Portsmouth to Fremont in return, um, and then Concord to Portsmouth and Fremont with a side job to Fremont. Uh, so they would go from Concord to Portsmouth and then uh, they would do a side job down the Fremont branch, which is a stub, of course, of the original. Uh, Worcester, Nashua, and Portland main line. And then they would continue, continue on to Portsmouth, reverse, and head back to where they came from. Now even though that regular passenger service had ended on the branch, um, it didn't mean passenger service in general ended on the branch. The Boston and Maine was obligated to continue passenger service uh, through the formation of mixed trains, which is something they did on some of their branch lines. Uh, this is a uh, William Higginbotham photo taken 1957, so four years after regular passenger service, three years rather, had ended on the branch. Here at Rockingham Junction, they're doing their work. Uh, they've got a GP7 on front, which was pretty standard for the mixed trains. Uh, usually it was one or two GP7s, sometimes a combination of GP7s and RS3s. Uh, but at this point in time, it's 1564. Uh, they've just come across the diamond, uh, and they're backing to their train, which is uh, on the other side of the diamond, on the Manchester side of the diamond. Um, a lot, lot, lot going on at Rockingham Junction here, as you can see as well. A lot of this would disappear um, in, the, in the ensuing years. Here's another shot. They've gone back towards their train. Uh, and this is the switch here for the Y, the East Y, or the West Y, rather, which connected up with the main line. And there they are crossing the double track at this time, uh, main line. 
just the light engine, so they're doing some switching there at Rockingham. <coughs> and this would be fr uh, freight C10, so Concord to Portsmouth was C10, uh, and C9 would have been the return job from Portsmouth. And there's the combine that they slapped on the rear to supplement that passenger obligation. Uh, it's actually interesting, this coach had uh, caboose handrails on the side of it. So technically this was classified as a caboose, wooden caboose. Um, and this combine still exists to this day, thankfully it's preserved. Um, this is from that same day as the other two shots. And this is interior of the shot here. So this combine, um, which was used for several years, probably until about 1960, in uh, passenger service on the Portsmouth Mixed, went down to Strasbourg, which is where it is today, and it's been beautifully preserved. So two years ago, James and I went down, um, and there was nobody on the train, so we got to ride in whatever coach we wanted, and that was the one that I wanted to ride in. And there it is, beautifully preserved. Huh. Yep. And it, it, at, point, at one point, it was lettered up Boston and Maine. They've lettered it up Strasbourg, uh, but it's the exact same, exact same combine and leaning out the baggage door. So that was pretty neat to be able to ride in that same piece of equipment, um, you know, 50, 60 years after it would have run through Raymond. But getting back to the 50s here, um, right after the end of passenger service, we have the mixed train here, which has left most of their consist up in Epping, and they've gone down the Fremont branch. This is in Fremont. Uh, and they're switching the industries at the end of the Fremont branch, which was about a five mile spur from Epping. Uh, and they're switching, I believe, Spalding and Frost, which made barrels. So you see the barrels in the truck here. Pretty neat photo. You don't often see um, a freight train and the equipment that they were hauling in the freight train in the same photograph, especially barrels, wooden barrels, something uh, which was getting outmoded at that point in time, but they were still producing it and shipping it by rail. Another shot here at Fremont. And this building is still there. Um, I believe it's a, owned by the town. It might be a library. Um, but it, uh, it's still standing, and as is the freight depot, which you can't see in this shot, um, but which is right here. So all that is still there. Of course, the track is long gone. <coughs> Another shot, and this is a neat shot because the, the steam engine standpipe is still there. Um, the branch probably last saw steam service for, pa uh, for freight service in 52, 53. Uh, so at this point in time, it would have been completely dieselized. Uh, but the standpipe was still there. Now the mixed train um, had made stops at Manchester where it would load passengers. Uh, so here we see the mixed train in Manchester. This is uh, late 50s. And interesting thing about this shot is you can see what was a major source of traffic on the Portsmouth branch. And in suing photographs you'll notice that most of the train is made up by oil tankers. Um, and the reason for that is because the Boston and Maine ran bridge traffic from Portsmouth to Manchester uh, with these oil cars. And oftentimes, uh, these oil cars would end up in places like Hillsborough for Valancourt Oil or up in Claremont, the Claremont and Concord. They got a lot of oil tankers from Portsmouth, uh, which would, of course, not have gone up the, uh, the Claremont branch from Concord, but down the Con River and up. Another shot with the combine. This is 1954. So this is right around the time that the mixed train service had started. This came from uh, Bruce Davison. And here we see the mix pulling into, uh, into Raymond, uh, 1955, so about a year later. Unbelievable color photographs. Another shot in Epping. So right here at Epping, which had originally been a diamond crossing between the Portsmouth branch and the Worcester, Nashua, and Portland main line, which was located right about here. Um, this point in time, obviously, uh, that had been abandoned, um, save for two spurs, which was the Fremont branch, which came off of just behind where the photographer is standing, and then another spur, which came off right about where the locomotive is, and ran up along Route uh, 125, which is where they would spot um, cars of grain for Merrimack Farmers Exchange, or feed, feeding grain. So we see the train coming into the station December 1955. If you notice, a lot of oil tankers on there, mostly what they were hauling at that point in time. And I've been told that this station does still exist. It was moved um, in the early 60s to um, an intersection just north of Epping with 125, and it's a bike shop now. And it's been modified pretty significantly, but it's the same general shape. So the building actually does still survive in a different location. 
making a short stop here station with the uh, mixed train and there they are at Rockingham in 57 and of course now this station does still exist and it was mostly renovated recently they painted a lot of it uh, but I did see recently that it's for sale again so I don't know uh, there was a plan to turn it into a car like a bike shop coffee shop type place I don't know if that fell through I did see a listing fairly recently that it's for sale again so if anybody's looking for a, a nice residence that would probably the place to do it if you're a rail fan. Now I did get a peek inside the building uh, not too long ago and uh, a lot of the wood furnishing from the inside is still there so uh, it's, it's in decent shape. Another shot, you can see the signals leading up to the diamond here for the branch. The only spot on the branch where they would have had signals, the rest of it was dark territory save for the, uh, the order boards on the station of course. Yeah, especially especially the in the yellow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I believe it was added around the time that they they put it into mixed train service, and then I think a lot of these coaches did end up in work train service, of course. Right. So yeah. Now this one was sold directly to the Strasbourg Railroad from the Boston to Maine, not long after it had ended service on the Portsmouth branch. So we're talking 60, 61 around there. It went directly to Strasbourg. So. Um, you're looking at a direct preservation, which is pretty cool. Well, that one never did work service. No, this one didn't. No, as far as I'm aware of, this one didn't. Yep. Cool. Another shot, pretty similar to the one we saw before, but you can see all the infrastructure is still there. Yeah, the section house. That's really neat. A neat black and white shot at Raymond. Look at all the cars, how close they are. Yeah. You go there today and, and there's, you know, even though it's, it's station still there and there's a lot of people that live around there, there's never that many cars there. Yeah, so pretty neat. Looks like a wild west town kind of. It kind of does, yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, Raymond was a, was a busy place and then when the tannery burned in the 70s, they lost a lot of, a lot of, a lot of business there. Um, and they lost a lot of jobs there too. So, yeah, you saw that a lot with some of these small towns. This car I see is a 54 Ford. Yep. Right next to you. Yeah. That's yeah, a great, great shot. That's a black and white negative that came from Scott Whitney. I believe that came from the Nash Ludlow collection, which was pulled out of the uh, roundhouse at North Walpole. Hmm. This is a shot that I have in my collection from Dick Sanborn, who was, um, you probably some of you may have know, known him personally. He's passed away, but he was uh, quite an authority on the Portsmouth branch. And he lived in Epping at one point. So a lot of his negatives have gone to an antique dealer in Epping, and he's been selling them on eBay, and a lot of them are going for way more than I can afford, but I managed to snag a few of them. This is one of them. Uh, mixed train with two cars and an RS3. This is probably late 50s. It wasn't undated, but... Yep. Now the freight schedule leading into the 60s, uh, as we talked about earlier, was freight's C10, uh, which is technically southbound from Concord to Portsmouth. Uh, it was a northbound, southbound branch, even though as the compass reads, it was east-west. And then C t uh, C9 would be the reverse job back to Portsmouth. <coughs> Here we are in Epping in 1963, so we're getting past the, the mixed train uh, period now, although we'll talk about in a minute that passengers were still permitted technically to ride the branch in freight cabooses, um, but they didn't have the coach anymore. This is 1963, they're coming off the Fremont branch, so this would be towards Fremont, and this is right towards the junction here. They're on the Portsmouth branch in this shot. Two RS3s, not an unusual consist, although most of the time you saw Jeep 7s, uh, but RS3s were, were rather relatively common on the branch. And this industry back here eventually became home gas. I don't know if it was home gas in 1963, but they do have some tankers here, so they are getting rail service. Here we are at Raymond in 1964. Um, so this is C9 coming back from Portsmouth with an RS3 and a GP7. I think the station at this point in time had been sold. It was privately owned. Uh, the Boston and Maine sold that station pretty quickly after passenger service ended. Uh, and it was used for a number of different things. It was used as an antique shop. It was used as... Uh, somebody told me it was used as a grocery store, although I don't know about that. And fast forwarding a little bit, this is 1967. So in addition to the oil traffic, which was a bridge traffic between Portsmouth and Concord, uh, Manchester Concord, another big commodity that the Boston Maine hauled was uh, sand and gravel. 
which came out of the Manchester Sand and Gravel Pit in Raymond. So we'll see some pictures of that moving forward in the presentation, but pretty healthy sized cut of cars on these trains, usually in the late 60s. Two Jeep 7s on the point here, uh, coming through Candia. Now interesting about this spot is you can't see it from where they are, but right behind the photographer is a very sharp curve. And the reason for that is originally this branch was built from Portsmouth directly to Concord by way of Suncook. But in 1861, they abandoned the section from Candy at a Suncook because it was too hilly to operate, just not effective to operate. And they favored a new alignment south towards Auburn and Manchester. So this is the spot where originally the line to Suncook had gone off. Um, but at this point in time, obviously, it was, it was not going that direction. Now, there was a team track at Candia on the other side of the train, probably right about here. And there was a customer there, um, Tiscolca Farms, and they got uh, cardboard egg cartons by rail. And they did that right up until the mid-70s. So it wasn't uncommon to see boxcars in Candia, but other than that, there were no freight customers in Candia at all. Now we'll take a ride on C10, courtesy of Dane Malcolm, who took this series of photos in April 1970, uh, from the cab of GP7 1567, which was leased at one point to a construction firm uh, called Mannix Construction, and they actually slapped their logos right on the front of the nose of the engine, um, which explains that strange logo there, which stayed with the engine until it was repainted uh, in the blue, uh, blue dip scheme in 1979 for the commuter operations, which the B&M was running. This was one of the last Jeeps in maroon and gold, I understand. Uh, but here in 1970, it's, it's still going to be in maroon for about nine years, so they're heading out on the branch, uh, heading towards, Co towards Manchester. This is on the New Hampshire main line in Concord, heading past the Concord shops. And there they are, leaning into the curve. So th this photo is not altered. This is the super elevation. Um, you can look at the angle of the window there at the top, leaning into the curve there at Hooksit Village, past Roby's store. And they're moving pretty quick at this point. So they get to Manchester, they're moving through the mill yard. The canal is still there. It hasn't been filled in. It would start to be filled in about a year later. So at this point in time, that's the upper canal. It's still, still in place, right alongside the main line, which was still a double track main line at this point in time as well. Along the mills, this is some of the mill housing that was built for the workers back in the uh, 19th century. And then they come into Manchester Yard here. You can see that the crossover is lined for the train, so they're going to head over onto the other main line and then up the Manchester and Lawrence branch for a short stretch until they head up onto the Portsmouth branch. Jumping forward a little bit, the next shots in the series are coming into Raymond. So here we are coming into Raymond. Uh, you can see the section house here on the right, which was there for a number of years until about 1975 when it was trucked sold to the town of Raymond by the Boston and Maine, trucked across the crossing, and placed next to the station. That's where it is today. There were about two more tracks on the left side of the, of the train here, uh, which were originally for Regis Tanning, which at this point in time uh, had burned down. And here they are by the station here in Raymond. Mm -hmm. This siding here um, originated just past the station, came over as, a, as two tracks, crossed Main Street, and then came over here by the freight house. So that's the freight house track right there. And there we are looking backwards towards the train on the Raymond station. Now at this point in time, 1970, uh, the sand pit in Raymond was still in, still in use. Uh, Manchester Sand and Gravel, which is up near Onway Lake Road and Old Manchester Road. But other than that, there were no freight, there's no freight business in Manchester, uh, I mean, uh, in Raymond at all. And um, a year later, um, Manchester Sand and Gravel would close in 1971, so there'd be no freight business in Raymond at all until 1976. Now the trains arrived at Rockingham, so they're going to do some work here at Rockingham Junction, set off some cars, and then they'll head off their way towards Portsmouth. <coughs> and you can see in comparison to the shots of the mixed train taken about 13 years earlier that things have gotten quite a bit uh, uh, deferred here in terms of maintenance and uh, landscaping. Obviously the B&M was in bankruptcy in 1970, uh, so not super prioritized, but it makes sense seeing as this wasn't an active passenger station. Still looks good for 1970s. It, it looks a lot better than it did in later years. Yeah, yeah. And you got the phone box there, of course, at the junction. Here they are, a little bit further on. The freight house was there until about 13, 12 or 13 years ago. It's gone now. Stub team track here. 
and they're on the main line now, which has been removed down to one track. And this is the Y, the East Y here. So they're going to go up the East Y onto the Portsmouth branch. Of course, this is still in service. Half of the Portsmouth branch, a little less than half, is still in service, including this Y track. That's how they access the industries in Portsmouth. But everything from this side of the diamond to Manchester is long gone. Continuing on the branch, we won't go too far east. Usually we'll, we'll stop at Rockingham for terms of uh, the abandonment, but uh, here we are east of that diamond here, uh, approaching Bayside Station in Stratum. And Greenland Station, or Stratum Station rather, <clears throat> a little bit further down. And that building is still there, but actually both these stations are still there. They're privately owned at this point. And you get a brief glimpse of the station at Portsmouth pulling in April 1970. And Dane Malcolm actually got a chance to operate the locomotive on the return trip. Now we talked a little bit about Manchester sand and gravel. This is their pit location uh, between Onway Lake Road, the overpass at Onway Lake Road, and the grade crossing at Old Manchester Road. Uh, it was quite an operation here. They had a loader, as you can see. There's actually a load operator right on top getting ready. Two RS3s on this day, April 29th, 1969. Bentley Crouch photo. <coughs> And this is an interesting operation. I've heard two accounts on how they loaded the freight cars. One of them I tend to believe for academic purposes. One of them I'd like to believe for comedic purposes. The first one is that the local crew would help load the cars. So they would pull the cars through one at a time for the loader. The second account is that the local crew would continue on their way, leaving the cut of cars on the main line because there was no siding here at all. And that employees from San Manchester Sand and Gravel would one by one remove the handbrakes from the cars load them and then run them downhill riding the handbrake because there was a downhill, cur uh, downhill slope here and bang them into each other and build up the consist. Now I don't know if that's true. I heard that from somebody that worked here. So it's possible they did both on different occasions. Um, but as you can see, it makes a lot more sense for them to have assisted with the locomotives. Uh, this is actually the same train, same day. This is a black and white negative. This is a color slide. Both were taken by Bentley Crouch. This is approaching Manchester Road. These two cars are headed for Fremont, lumber car for uh, Fremont Furniture. Two RS3s, elephant style, pretty classic for that period. And this is all overgrown now. The embankment is very visible still, but there's a lot of trees. And you can see all the aggregate in the background that they had been uh, mining from that pit. Another shot. So when they came back from Portsmouth, obviously there was a cut of loaded cars sitting right on the main. They couldn't do anything about it. So they would pull up, connect with the cars, and then back everything down to Raymond and do the runaround in downtown Raymond. <coughs> Quite an operation. You would think they would have built a siding in there, but uh, they didn't have a siding at, at uh, Manchester Sand and Gravel. This is October 27, 1969, about two years before the pit was shut down completely. Uh, Rick, I have a question. Yeah. Why were the hoppers sitting on the, on the main? There was no siding. Yeah. Were, were they loaded there? They would load them and they would leave them there for the return job from Portsmouth to pick them up. So they would have to, this is the return job. These are all the cars from Portsmouth. They've already, already run around. These are the cars they have to drag back to Portsmouth and run around. So they're going to have the engines in the middle, the consist, backing to, to Raymond. Quite a yeah, they've got to have a guy on the rear, of course. Well, that was important, your theory of uh, them riding the cars, yeah. the employees themselves. Because two locomotives obviously went to Portsmouth and turned around. Yeah. So maybe that second theory was. Yeah, I mean, the, you never know. There, there's got to be some truth in it somewhere. Some conflict, though. Yeah. Obviously, coal cars on the other side. Right, the right. Because these would have been these would have been the um, <clears throat> these would have been the ones that were just loaded. I would imagine these ones were empties, and they were going to spot them. It, it was. It, there's there's different yeah. accounts on how they did it, but they got it done somehow. Yeah. Here they are heading east. So this is um, <clears throat> these are loaded cars they've already picked up. Um, and this, yeah, so these would be, yeah, this is in Heading, which is uh, west, East Epping. Uh, that's the Route 27 crossing in the background. Yeah. Yep, solid cut of gravel cars. You can see it's quite a bit of, of revenue there, but it kind of leads you to imagine that what would happen when that ended. And that did end in about two years. And you can see that after that, it would have only been two or three cars at a time. Rick, you know, Equipment going. Where is the sand going to? Is it a highway construction? It's a little late to have been the Revere extension. 
Although it's possible. Yeah, that came out of I think it was to, to Somerville, to, to Manchester, Boston, Sand and Gravel. I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. Um, I've never really found out where it went to. But Man whoever Manchester, Sand and Gravel was doing business with that at, at that time, I would assume. You did make the late 60s that uh, 93 won't pass. Yeah. There was also the 90s, and they did the extension at Logan, too. They delivered the materials to Portsmouth. Yeah. Too. Yeah, and it, it may have been, that's right, when they did the bridge, the 93 bridge in Portsmouth yeah. over, uh, over the Scatequa River. It's yeah. very possible that that was where that was going. They were still doing interstate in Manchester, too. Yep. So there was a lot of, a lot of roadway infrastructure construction not related to the railroads at this time, which um, the railroad was helping with, which, you know, obviously revenue for them, but did it help them in the end? No. So... But here you can see here, this is the, the freight house siding in Raymond. These are some of the cars uh, which the B&M uh, was using in sand service. This is 1967. This is an ex-Bessemer and Lake Erie hopper. This is a Dick Hoisington photo. Yep. And this sign here, Prescott Farms Supermarket, uh, I believe that's what was in the station at this time. Either that or it was, was further back, but the station was privately owned. <laughs> yeah, so this is something interesting that happened on the Portsmouth branch that uh, it's come out in, in recent years. Uh, they ran enough unit out on the Portsmouth branch. Obviously, GP7s and RS3s were preferred, and that's what they tended to use. But from time to time, especially from here on out, we'll start to see some odd power on the Portsmouth branch. So we have 4268A here at Rockingham. Uh, these are Wayne Allen photos. And I actually did find out that there's some other photos out there of this that do exist. So hopefully, we'll, we'll discover some more of that. They probably did, probably up to Concord. Up to yep, yep. They probably. I don't know what the impetus was to have used this on a branch local instead of a mainline job, but they did. They did. And here you can see them. Uh, they're getting ready to head back to Concord in Manchester, so the uh, F unit is trailing, heading back on C. You know. Yep. The RS3 is a, a pretty, uh, pretty faded there. So. They didn't have the headlights on back then. <laughs> I imagine they weren't as. Uh, it wasn't as strict as it is today. No ditch lights either. So, This is another sand train. This is at Massabesic, right before the, um, the Route 28 crossing. Um, this is the local freight with some sand cars. Now, I, the person that took this photo, Louis Bodwin, he told me that the sand cars on this were going to, or coming from, a runway extension at Pease Air Force Base. So that may be true as well. There was a lot going on at this point in time, as we said, for infrastructure. Uh, but there's a woman there in the woods, probably hiking on the right of way. Uh, and then you've got the uh, the crew. Yeah, 1556 and an RS3, and the, the box car is probably from one of the branch industries. But all that heavy tonnage on on such a branch, which was spiked directly to the ties, and at this point in time, as we know, the the bankruptcy was starting to weigh pretty heavily on on the branch lines, uh, lent itself to derailments. So here we are in Auburn, New Hampshire, my current hometown, April 26, 1969. They've had a wreck. Well, despite the, uh, the end of sand traffic, the local freight still continued, and uh, they were still going down the Fremont branch. So here we are in Epping, uh, looking, looking south on the, on the Fremont branch. They're coming back with an empty, uh, two empties rather, and the brakemen are uh, up front on the locomotive, 1563. This is another Dick Sanborn. So as 1970 rolled around, you started to see another shift in operations on the branch, whereas in the 50s you had seen the shift away from passenger service. In the 70s you saw the shift away from the bridge traffic, which was that oil traffic, and the shift away from that heavy traffic in terms of the sand cars. So around 1970, we're here in 1971, local C-10, still going as far as Rockingham and sometimes Portsmouth, but in the years following that would start to change. Of course you started to see the blue dips on the branch here as well. Now, the early 1970s, the Boston Maine were running a series of inspection trips on their branch lines. This is at the point when Barringer was president. Um, and these were, these were termed inspection trips. Uh, and they would take the 6212 out on the branches, which is the only bud car that had a kitchenette. Um, I've heard some people say they were inspection trips. I've heard some people say they were just kind of pleasure cruises, checking out the branches. Barringer was sort of a rail fan. Um, so it's possible it was kind of both at the same time. But here they are in East Candia. With, an, uh, with a Bud car in 1971. And this is one of two times that Bud RDCs ever ran on the Portsmouth branch. 
and at Raymond coming through the station. Of course, things are starting to get a little bit decrepit here in terms of uh, the foliage. Pretty common for the, for the branch lines at this point in time. The 6212, yep, already C2. <coughs> the freight schedule in 1962 had been revised again. Uh, at this point in time, it was no longer C C10 and C9, it was C4 and C5. And according to this, they were operating out of Manchester and not Concord. Sunday through Tuesday and Thursdays. So once the, uh, the gravel traffic had dropped down, the number of days they were operating the branch dropped down as well. Another shot at Rockingham in 1971, doing some switching there. And 1972, uh, Y5, they had switched the designation again. So it went from C5, C4 and C5 to, to Y5 and Y6. So as things happened on the branch lines, the freight jobs started to change in terms of what they were being designated. But 1972, we still have two maroon and gold Jeeps on Y5 at, at Candia. And you can see some of that curve there which was the new alignment after 1861-1862. I'd love to know what that bumper sticker says there on the front. Not Trump. <laughs> Probably not. No, not back then. And there they are again. You can see the grade heading up towards East Candia. This is in Candia. The team track is probably right about where the photographer is standing. That's where they would spot those cars of uh, cardboard egg cartons. Yeah, and here we can see that freight change here. So this is um, in 1974, June 27th. Uh, the designation is Y6, Y5, and they're only working the branch Concord to Rockingham on Wednesdays. So it's dropped down again by the mid-70s. Now we got the chance to chase a train out on the Portsmouth branch in 1973, thanks to Bentley Crouch. He followed the local freight <coughs> behind GP7 1570, which actually showed up on the branch quite a bit. Here they are at Severance, which is uh, Massabesic, Lake Massabesic in Auburn. Um, you can see by the tonnage they're carrying, things are not looking too good on the branch. They've only got, uh, it looks like, a box car of feed for Merrimack Farmers Exchange in Epping and a tank car of uh, gas for home gas in Epping. So they're not carrying very much at that point in time. Sad. Yeah, and the roadbed, like we said, it was, it was spiked directly to the ties. Um, they were doing maintenance on it, but you know, only tie jobs where it was absolutely necessary. So, um, two car freights, uh, just not a priority. And the speed limits on this point were starting to get r really down there. There they are at the curve. You can really see the curve here in Candia, coming up towards the Candia station site, the uh, main street in Candia. And at that fill there in, um, Raymond. So if you look closely in the background of the shot, you can still see quite a bit of sand and aggregate there. So the plant had shut down in 70, 71, but they still had a lot of leftover. So they, they did ship some of that out by rail, but most of that came out by truck. And by this time, 73, 74, they were starting to dismantle a lot of the equipment at the pit. Uh, none of that came out by rail. But if you look here at the freight consist, they've picked up a boxcar from Candia. That's, a, that's an empty car from that farm that was doing business out of Candia. And pretty neat roller coaster shot here in West Epping. But yeah, as you said, the track's not looking too good. And the drainage ended up becoming a real problem on the branch. That was one of the reasons that, uh, that it was embargoed, as we'll see later on. And now we get to Epping. So here they are um, crossing. <coughs> that's not St. Lorenz Street. I think that's Railroad Ave. Um, St. Lorenz Street would be further back. Uh, but you can see the spur that went up along Route 125. That was part of the old Y track for the uh, Worcester, Nashua, and Port, uh, Portland Division main line. And here's the main track. This is the fence for home gas. So everything in Epping was pretty much consolidated around this area. And they've gone up the spur. So what they did here is they dropped their cars on the main and they cut the engine off light. They go up the spur to pick up an empty box car of uh, feed from Merrimack Farmers Exchange. Now if you look closely at this photo, you can see a set of rails right here. They had their own elevator at one point in Epping. And it was actually still there until the early 60s, but it was torn down and they would just spot the box cars right here, just past this crossing, take a pickup truck over from Merrimack Farmers, unload the cars, and bring it back to the store location. So 
some sort of a trestle up there, there for the, for the spur? Uh, it was uh, an elevator, so they would spot the um, the cars right next to the elevator. Oh, just an extra yep. track coming up. Yep. Yeah. It was a gr just a grain elevator siding. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But that that had been uh, that had either burned down or had been demolished at this point. And now that they've done their switching on the WN and P spur, they're heading down what's left of the Fremont branch to run around this tank car, and then they're going to back it into home gas, which is right about here. The last freights to go to Fremont went to Fremont in 1971. Fremont Furniture and Spalding and Frost were still doing freight business at that time, but after 1971, there was no freight business to be conducted in Fremont, so the only freight operations on the Fremont branch were right here in Epping, just by the junction for home gas. And this was the runaround track right here. They had a very short runaround track. Now, if you ever get permission from the guy that owns home gas, you can go in the woods and find the turntable pit, which is still there, wow. which was um, obviously there when it was a major junction point between the Portsmouth branch and the main line. And there they are uh, getting ready to do their runaround there. So. This, the Fremont branch, when you go um, east on 101, right before exit 7, you can see the Fremont branch go off on either side of, 120, um, of 101. Actually crossed at grade, crossed 101 at grade. It was a smaller highway then, but it did cross one with a grade crossing. But of course, not after 1971. This is an interesting series of photographs. This was taken by uh, Ben Crouch. Um, obviously, the Portsmouth branch being a link between the center of the state and the seacoast, uh, you did see some interesting moves go over the Portsmouth branch, especially in the 70s. So here on May 15th, 1974, we have local Y6 heading to Rockingham Junction with uh, Claremont Concord 70 tenor number, um, number 9, which was going to the Belfast and Moosehead Lake. They've got a boxcar of feed for Merrimack Farmers Exchange, which was almost always B&M 40 footers. Obviously, they did the business out of the uh, facility, which is now Blue Seal and Concord at Bow Junction. Uh, so that was uh, pool service between, um, from the Boston and Maine's um, uh, customers on the branches to the loading spot at, at Bow Junction. So those cars were in captive service back and forth. And this 50-foot boxcar, keep an eye on this boxcar, because it's going to magically disappear in a minute. Here they are in Auburn. This is uh, pretty close to where I live. This is where the Auburn Depot was located. It's all part of a bike path now. Uh, but the bridge is still there, and it looks pretty similar to as it, as it used to. Now here they are in Candia, coming up on the curve. So you can see, uh, see it's starting to get pretty overgrown. Now where did the boxcar go? And why are there two different boxcars here? The only customer from this spot to Candia was the farm at Candia. So they were doing enough business to pick up two empty 50-foot boxcars in 1974 from a company that was shipping, uh, was receiving cardboard egg crates in Candia, New Hampshire, of all places. So that was the kind of traffic you saw on these branches. Very small companies, no large companies at this point in time, uh, just very small loads, very small uh, uh, consignees. Yeah, and there they are again at West Epping. So this is... Uh, about a year later from the shot that we previously saw. And coming up on, uh, on heading, not too far from where the, uh, the racetrack is in Epping. They've just crossed Route 27 behind us. The Little Fields is uh, technically between New Fields and Epping. So you almost never saw any photos taken in Little Fields. It was that remote. Uh, but we've got a shot here of them heading through the countryside on the Portsmouth branch. And it looks like, yeah, you're right, they've dropped those two empties. So they must have dropped those two empties in Epping. I would imagine they only went as far as Rockingham to drop the 70 tonner, and then they were going to go back, and the reason they kept the loaded feed car is because they have to back up the WNNP on their way back to Manchester. So they'll run around that car in in, uh, in Rockingham. And quicker than going up, the, quicker than going to Massachusetts and up the western route too. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But you'd think a branch like this with that connection would have had more bridge traffic, would have had more mm. unique moves, but 
it just they didn't have the online customers to keep it keep it maintained. So here they are crossing the diamond with the 70 tonner, and they're going to spot it. And there they are on the east Y. The local freights were still getting shorter and shorter. We're here at Massabesic, Route 28 crossing. This flag um, flag signal was still here a number of years after the branch was abandoned. I'm not sure when it finally came down, but it's not there anymore. Somebody's probably. probably. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got it. <clears throat> here they are in Candia. The first Main Street crossing had an automatic flagman signal, so a wigwag without the wigwag, basically. I think that battery well is still there, but I'm not 100% sure. At Candia, of course, coming around the curve. One boxcar of feed for Merrimack Farmers Exchange, and the, the other 50-foot boxcar is probably for W.S. Goodrich, which was a brick company in, in Epping, just east of 125. Another big customer for the railroad. Well, big for the branch. Uh, yeah. Not big, but. At Raymond. And in Epping. So here they are with an empty from Merrimack Farmers. Down to the main and drop the empty off. And now that they've gone back up and dropped a load, they're heading back to Manchester. So. By 1974, there really was no need to run through to Rockingham, so most of the trains that ran out on the Portsmouth branch never got beyond Epping. Here they are at Candia. Very emblematic of the type of scenery on the branch. You had a lot of ponds, a lot of pine trees, but not a lot of panoramic vistas, not a lot of beautiful shots. It was definitely a unique branch, but certainly not one of the more photogenic. And actually, interestingly enough, there was an article published in the B&M Bulletin right after the branch was um, abandoned, a one-page article, kind of a tribute to the Portsmouth branch, and they talk about how it wasn't, wasn't super photogenic as a branch, um, which may, may explain the reason there's not a lot of photos out there. Crossing Main Street on the way back, you can see the automatic flagman in operation. One empty for Merrimack Farmers Exchange in a caboose. That's your revenue. That's a five-man crew for, for one car. Yep. Now, as the 70s progressed, the power started to switch up a little bit. We've seen GP9s on the branch, whereas originally we only saw 7s and RS3s. Now we started to see GP18s and 38s on the branch as well. So here we are in, in Raymond. Y6 coming out of Manchester, October 2nd. They've got 1751 on the point and one car of revenue from Iraq Farmers Exchange. At this point in time, absolutely no freight business in Raymond whatsoever. They'd stopped to get pie and coffee, and that was about it. I guess you could say that was lost revenue. <clears throat> Another really good shot here showing the runaround track on the Fremont branch and home gas right behind. They've just spotted that car <coughs> at the plant. And the Portsmouth, ran the Portsmouth branch runs east-west east in the background behind the caboose. This is about as far as they were going on the Fremont branch in 1974. No further. Yep, and they've got an empty from Merrimack Farmers Exchange, an empty from Home Gas, and they're going to... Oh, actually, no, that would be the empty. Yep, that's the empty from, home, from Merrimack Farmers Exchange, and they've got a load in the consist. So a little bit of switching to do there. You can see the old passenger... Uh, platform is still in place. Some of that is still in place, even today. This is still a propane company. It's um, suburban now. So. And a really nice shot of how they would unload the boxcars at Merrimack Farmers Exchange on the spur, the uh, WNNP spur along 125. <coughs> To my knowledge, uh, nobody's ever done these in HO scale yet. I'd like to see that. That's Just about, yeah. Yeah, no graffiti at all. Good. Nope. I mean. So as the regular freight started to drop off on the branch, and as a few important construction develops, developments started happening on the seacoast, you started to see uh, quite a bit more high and wide unique moves on the branch. So here we are in 1974, brand new painted 1566 blue dip. Probably, sm probably smelled pretty good. It does, yeah. It looks like the Atlas ones they did. 
Yeah. <coughs> They've got a generator load. So high and wide moves were favored on the Portsmouth branch because there were no um, clearance issues. All the bridges were uh, plate girders. There were no, no trusses. Um, the overpasses were clearable at this point. It's not like today where they have those pipe tunnels under 93 for the bikers. It was a bridge at that point. So um, you could take containers, or uh, not containers, generators rather, over the branch. And this is the Fremont branch here uh, curving away. Here they are at Raymond. Might you know where that was at? Probably Seabrook. Yeah. Probably, yeah. You'll see some stuff with con uh, connected to Seabrook here. I don't know where this was going to or coming from, but this is the only, the only thing I've ever seen or heard about this particular move. That's the thing about the Portsmouth branch, especially for somebody my age. It takes a lot of digging to find anything on it. But there they are. Things are looking pretty bad at this point. At Candia, you can't see the team track, but it's there somewhere. East Manchester. One of the only spots on the Portsmouth branch that looks almost exactly like this today. When you're heading north on 93, um, <clears throat> right after the Candia Road exit, look off to your right. That Quonset hut's still there. This road is still here. And the right-of-way through the marsh is still there. That's right next to uh, 93. Yep, this is taken from 93. Yep, this is this was taken on 93, right before 101 and 93 split in Manchester. Yep. And um, I looked, I was driving this, this connecting road. This is a one-way connecting road. There's another one on the other side of the highway going in the other direction. Um, and there's some sort of whistle post or a mile post. or might even be the, the underpass marker. Uh, is, is been knocked over, but it's still there. So there's quite a bit of uh, stuff to, if you know where to look on the Portsmouth branch. But So we talked a little bit about high and wides. And this particular move is going to Seabrook. So we're here at Epping in 1977, fasting forward a few years. Uh, we got a GP38 on point. Uh, it's the only photo I've ever seen of a GP38 on the Portsmouth branch. <coughs> but a pretty heavy move, pretty slow. I imagine they weren't moving very fast. Now you can see the, um, the flat car. This is the Fremont branch in the foreground curving away. That caboose is at, um, well, I don't know where it's going now, but it was at Saratoga North Creek. It's a General Electric caboose. <coughs> so as the branch started to run out of customers and run out of service, you started to see some interest in abandoning it, which naturally made a lot of sense. 1976, these were the customers on the Portsmouth branch outside of the East Manchester switching limits. So we're not talking about any of the customers in East Manchester that were switched by Manchester switchers. This is everything that was handled by the branch locals. R.C. Hazelton in East Manchester, which is right next to the Goldenrod in Manchester, if you know where that is, in East Manchester, was a construction firm. They got heavy equipment by flat car. Jessica Farms got their uh, cardboard egg cartons and candy at the team track. Merrimack Farmers Exchange in Epping, they were offloading at the WN and Peace Spur, as you've seen. Home Gas in Epping, technically on the Fremont branch, but right at the junction was getting uh, propane at their private siding. W.S. Goodrich was getting bricks at their private siding on the east side of 125, which had just been demolished and redeveloped as a uh, uh, commerce park or something. Uh, J.F. Brown would get uh, farm machinery at the team track in Epping, and the Rooker Company would get farm machinery at the team track in Epping. These are the customers in 1976 when they did the first official abandonment inquiry. One of the in interesting things that they outline in the abandonment inquiry is that the possibility was brought up about a short line purchasing or possibly leasing the branch. I would imagine it had something to do with the White Mountain branch being uh, bought by the state of New Hampshire. But it was deemed it would be impossible because the, if you had a short line lease that branch, you wouldn't be able to connect at Manchester because the B&M was still using um, the branch in East Manchester to switch all the industrial customers. And you wouldn't be able to connect in Rockingham because the B&M was still using the, the branch at Rockingham for the Y tracks. So you'd have an isolated branch in the middle with no real place to interchange, with no real customers. So it, it didn't make a lot of sense. Also, it was interesting to note that in Epping in the 70s, 
there was no industry in Epping. There was no commerce in Epping. There was no economy in Epping. So there was no potential rail users. There was nobody that would want to use rail. Nowadays, you look at Epping and it's, it's booming. But it's booming in a different way. It's booming for retail and commerce, not for in industry. Um, and at this point in time, there were only 10 cars a week traveling from Portsmouth to Manchester for petroleum um, between 1969 and 1972. By 1976, that petroleum bridge traffic was gone. Um, so there really wasn't any impetus to keep the branch in service. But it was shot down. They didn't abandon the branch in 1976. They tried again in November 1976. The BNM was losing $50,000 annually on the branch. Um, they were only making $12,000 of revenue in the first six months of 1976. Mm -hmm. One car for RC Hazleton of um, heavy machinery, 18 carloads for Merrimack farmers, 14 carloads of gas in Epping, one carload of fire machinery, another off carload of Buxton machinery, total of 35 cars, 1,550 tons in the first six weeks of uh, 1976. They tried again, but again it got shot down. They did not abandon the branch in 1976. <coughs> And there was a proposal to ship pulpwood out of Fremont. There's a company in, Pul in Fremont that wanted to ship pulpwood, but the B&M responded that they didn't have any uh, bulkhead flat cars, they didn't have any in incentive to buy any, so uh, there was no real reason to, to do that. And the track probably wouldn't have supported the tonnage either. At that point in time, there were 11,560 ties that were needed to bring the track up to 10 mile an hour classification. <laughs> The interesting thing about the abandonment files, and if you're interested in reading these, these are all on our website on the uh, online archive, you can read them. They had the trustee lawyers question all the customers on the Portsmouth branch. And obviously the Boston and Maine, the trustees wanted to get rid of the branches, they wanted to cut the, cut the costs, which makes a lot of sense. They were losing a lot of money on the branch. But the questioning directed towards some of the customers was very pointed. Um, and here you had the guy that was in charge of Merrimack Farmers Exchange in Bow Junction. Carl Bruno, whose business relied solely on rail service. And you have the trusty lawyer asking him how much his business relies on rail service and wouldn't it be possible to do trucks instead. Really interesting if you read it. He says that we could spend $50,000 to load all the trucks and the, the, the answer from the trustee lawyer is, well, that's not impossible, is it? So you could see where it was heading. And just some more information talking about the, the freight on the branch. Uh, there was only $7,000 of freight originating or terminating on the branch. The revenue was dropping down. <coughs> but in the late 70s, <coughs> Seabrook went nuclear. And so it became necessary to move large amounts of equipment from Manchester to Portsmouth and then down to Seabrook. Why they didn't go from the western route to Portsmouth, I don't know. But I would imagine it had something to do with the high and wides needing that clearance over the Portsmouth branch. This is a shot in Seabrook unloading some pipes. It's a Getty Images. They wanted $499 to buy this image. So I figured nobody would care, so I slapped it in there. But <clears throat> there we are. You can see the guy in the pipe. How many train cars can count? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many pipes are there, but quite a bit. about 10? Yeah, and of course, Seabrook was famous for the protests and the news coverage. Uh, a lot going on there with the Clamshell Alliance, no more nukes. But they came over the Portsmouth branch and here they are in Auburn with two GP7s and pipes crossing uh, the inlet there for Lake Massabesic. Richard Anderson photo, he was the freight clerk in uh, Manchester. And there they are crossing Depot Road with the pipes and a special move for the Wolfboro Railroad, gas electric car. Really nice shot in the grove, the, uh, the pine grove there at Massabesic. Just stumbled on these photos two years ago, didn't even know they existed. And there they are again in East Manchester at the, ta um, <clears throat> the wigwag there at Taylor Street. Or not Taylor Street, that's um, you know, right by Elliott Hospital. Taylor Street was further back, that's where the, uh, the, grand, the elevator was. Candia by the automatic flagman. One Jeep. In 1977, the diamond at Rockingham was removed because there were really no freights that were moving from Epping to Rockingham or further. So all of these 
high and wides would have had to utilize the Y tracks to get to Portsmouth. But even though there were high and wides, the locals were still continuing most times with one or two cars. Here they are arriving in Manchester from Concord with a bicentennial Jeep. They've got one car from Merrimack Farmers Exchange, 1977. You probably wouldn't want to go anywhere near the movie theaters at this point in time. What's that building to the right? It's the old yard office tower in Manchester. Tower? Mm-hmm. I thought the tower in Manchester was the first building. That was the, C, uh, the CTC tower. There was the yard office and then there was the CTC uh, tower, which is the brick one. Yeah. Yep. That would have been behind the photographer. Yep. Looks like you've seen better days. Yeah, it was still still uh, still had offices in it at that point. The Brit the the um, CTC tower was closed by seventy seven. Now this this is the Portsmouth branch in nineteen seventy eight. This is Hooksett Road in Auburn, approaching the underpass. Looks like a jungle. All the drainage. There it is again. One boxcar for W.S. Goodrich and Epping, one boxcar for Merrimack Farmers Exchange. That's the Jeep that was torched in White River Junction during the strike. And a buggy. Four five-man crew for two cars. 27 miles. No weed killer ring going down there? No, nothing. Very cool shot here, 1979. This is the engine that became the 77 and was just sold to Utah. No cars at all. No revenue at all. They're going to pick up empties in Epping. Coming up on Route, route uh, 28, 1979. And now they are going away. Right by Massabesic uh, Beach. Well, not, not a beach because you can't swim there, but close, as close to a beach as you'll get on Lake Massabesic. The branch was embargoed in December 1979. They did another abandonment hearing. They were losing $28,000 to the estate in six months. There had been a 97.4 decline traffic between 66 and 75. Most of the customers had switched to trucks. They could no longer haul propane to home gas because the track conditions. There was one new customer, Rerig Pacific at Raymond, just, uh, just west of the crossing there by the McDonald's and um, the 101 Junction. And they were actually increasing in carloads. Two carloads in 77, five in 78, six in the first six months of 79. Business was up too for R.C. Hazleton. They got 14 cars of heavy machinery in 1978. That's the one that was in East Manchester by uh, the Golden Rod. But as we said, home gas wasn't getting any cars. Merrimack Farmers was dropping. W.S. Goodwiss was dropping. Track conditions had the track to five miles an hour or slower. $61,050 needed for repairs. That's up by almost $50,000 from the 76 uh, inquiry. <coughs> you can see here, this is 1980, January 1980. The Portsmouth branch from East Manchester to Rockingham Junction, including the Fremont branch, has been highlighted as pending for abandonment. At that point in time, the Hillsborough branch from uh, Bennington to Hillsborough had been approved for abandonment in 79. The Peterborough branch from Jaffrey to Peterborough had been approved in 72. And the Greenville branch from Townsend to Greenville had been approved in 72. Merrimack branch from Newton to Merrimack approved for abandonment in 72. And I think that's, I don't know what that is there. It looks like maybe the city track in Newburyport. So. A lot of the branch, a lot of the rural branch lines, Boston and Maine, one or two customers, they just couldn't sustain it with the bankruptcy. It made natural sense to abandon it. But despite the fact that the branch was heading, heading south fast, GP40s made it out on the Portsmouth branch. This was probably road power for EDCO, and they took it off the road power in Concord, gave it to the CO1 local. At this point in time, the local from Concord to Epping was designated CO, was part of CO1, that was part of their duties. Here they are at Taylor Street in East Manchester, the Agway um, elevator is just behind us. Elliott Hospital in the background. 
car, uh, empty flat car from uh, Hazelton by Goldenrod, empty hoppers from that new plastics company in Raymond. 17 year, uh, just about 17 years later and six days, I'd be born up there and the tracks were just being removed. <laughs> just missed it. I just missed it by a lot. And there they are again. 315, brand new. 70, they were built in late 77, I believe. This is October 78. The pride and joy of the B&M on the Portsmouth branch. Is that been the same engine that had done the Goffstown branch? They, that's right, they ran the Goffstown branch and the fuel tank was scraping the ties. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But Agway in East Manchester was handled by the East Manchester switcher and that was an extremely busy customer. So even though the Portsmouth branch from East Manchester to Rockingham would be abandoned in 82, all the customers from East Manchester to Manchester Yard were still in service until the late 1980s. And it was handled as the East Manchester running track. Now, I'd love for somebody to tell me why the branch was embargoed in December 1979 and why in July 21st, 1980, there's a freight coming back from Raymond <coughs> with another GP40. This is uh, right by Mammoth Mills. That's long gone, but right at Mammoth Road in Manchester by the Wigwag. Elliott Hospital would be behind us. What's the date on the photos, huh? Nope. This was taken by Dick Anderson. And we'll find out in the abandonment documents from 1979 that despite the embargo, cars did make their way out to Rear Rig Pacific and Raymond right up until July 1980. Wow. Yep. So the last train, they said the last train from East Manchester to, to Raymond at least was July 31st, 1980. This is July 21st. So this could work very well be the last or the second to last train ever to run through Auburn, Candia, Raymond, Epping. Well, probably not Epping because they would have only gone as far as Raymond, so. Rockingham, at that point in time, 1979, was seeing no local freight from the Manchester Concord area. This is looking towards the junction. This is the West Y track. They were using it for car storage and they used it for car storage right up until about 2001. Then they stopped using it for car storage and they cut it at both ends, but the Y track is still there in the woods. So you can go see that. All of these tracks are gone. That's a recreational trail. Taken by David Krushwitz. He was a B&M employee at the time. Looking towards the junction. Of course, the diamond is gone at this point in time. This is 1979. The diamond was removed in 77. So even if you had through traffic, you'd have to use the Y tracks. There's no reason that you would go down to the diamond unless you had to do a runaround. Did you know what that craft that David was in? Um, I think he was in the engineering department. He worked for the BAR too. But he's, he's um, emerged on Facebook recently so he's been posting a lot, of his, a lot of his stuff. He has some stuff in Amesbury right before they lifted the rails. Yeah. He was in the transportation department. Is that it true? Okay. No. Here they are, 1979, maroon and gold switcher, probably a Dover local. Pretty unusual to see that maroon and gold at that point in time, but there were some kicking around. Probably a good runner, didn't need to go to the, the shop to get painted, repaired. And there's the Y track. This is all still around today, except for the freight house, some of the signal comp components. And looking south, you can see those cars stored on the Y track. If anybody ever models Rockingham Junction, you have to get these pine trees in there. Every shot of Rockingham Junction has these pine trees in them. So at 1979, once the branch was embargoed, they started the serious process to have it abandoned. Like we said, the last trains ran to Raymond in July 1980, so even though the embargo was in place, they were still going out. There was some dispute from various customers on the branch about the abandonment. One of them came from the Caldwell Corporation which was off of Candia Road. They hadn't been a rail customer since the early 70s, but they disputed the abandonment. <clears throat> Engineering studies showed that um, total rehabilitation of the Portsmouth and the Fremont branch would cost uh, almost $900,000. And that every crossing was in serious condition, ditching and, and vegetation was a serious problem everywhere, and the decline in revenue could not be uh, developed to offset the losses. So on March 20th, 1982, the abandonment went in effect at 27 miles from East Manchester to Rockingham Junction, including the Fremont branch. And this shows the abandonment. 
And this also shows you where everything was on the branch. We didn't have a map at the beginning, unfortunately, but this might help you kind of visualize everything. Massabesic in East Manchester. And it goes up towards Candia, which is not labeled on the map. Raymond, Epping, Fremont, and Rockingham Junction. Do they still retain the ownership of those branch lines? Uh, the state of New Hampshire owns the right away. Uh, so it was transferred at some point. Not, not at this time. I think it was afterwards. It's not highlighted in the abandonment files, but uh, it's now owned by the state. So. And some numbers here. This is how much they had uh, anticipated it would cost to restore the Portsmouth branch and 4.5 miles from Epping to Fremont. $100,000 for five, five miles of track. Yeah. So in 1985, the branch came up, had been out of service for five years, abandoned for three. This is right by the racetrack in Epping, East Epping. And this is right by the station spot here in Epping. This is that passenger uh, platform. This is where the, the spur up along 125 curved up. They bundled the ties. Heading. That's in East Epping. April 14th, 85. Cut the bolts, moved the rails, bundled the ties. That was that. But there's a bright, bright piece to all this because the other half of the Portsmouth branch is still in service and it's actually doing very well recently. Uh, Pan Am just opened up, or not opened up, but they expanded their uh, propane facility in Newington. So we've been seeing 14, 15, 16 car trains running from Rockingham to Portsmouth in the last few weeks. They've reinstalled the Portsmouth switcher, which is running from Portsmouth to Rockingham instead of Dover to, Ro uh, Dover to Portsmouth. So uh, they've got enough business to house a, a switcher in Portsmouth. So there is a bright, bright point to all this, but Portsmouth Branch, it was an interesting line. It's one of those branch lines of the Boston and Maine that you may have read about in a book and never saw any photos of. It's one that I certainly read about in books and never saw any photos of. Um, but the photos are out there. Uh, the information is out there. There's so many branches out there that had history, customers that were relying on the service that saw trains into 1979, 1980, which is pretty, pretty fantastic when you're thinking about the kind of freight that they were moving at that point on these branches. Um, but if anybody has taken photos on the Portsmouth branch, they know anybody that has, um, certainly get in touch with me. I'd love to see them. Um, there's more stuff coming out of the woodwork now than there ever was before. And it's all part of piecing together that story of what happened 40 years ago now. So I appreciate you coming out to listen. <coughs> Yes. Oh, yeah. Any questions? Yep. We have a microphone too. If anybody has uh, has questions. Oh uh, no. No. I guess I explained myself pretty good then. If you have anything, please send me an email. I'd love to see it. That was fabulous. Thank you. I think the whole thing, by the way.